Hi, Katie. <laughs> well, this is such a treat. I haven't seen you in probably 10 years, I'm thinking. Um, I think even maybe more. Maybe more. Is I see your uh, boy Max there. It's a little bit, a little bit bigger than he was the last time I saw him. So when did we? When did you see Max? Like where? When was it? Was it? We, we were in. We were hanging up. We met up by the river. Um, uh, yes. The park would be Mawson Park there, and uh, Amber was there. And I don't think we had our kids yet, so. There's probably between 2008 and 2010, I'm guessing. Okay. Or 11, maybe yeah. it's 2010 that it happened, maybe. That, that may be. That's 10 years. See, one thing I've noticed from your podcast is you have a great memory. Uh, you do. remember a lot of details. And so I will be relying on you for a lot of that because I feel like I need a bit of a, a wash for a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of this stuff brings it up. A lot of this conversation kind of, it's kind of funny how your memory works because everything gets kind of lost. And then you get these little triggers that kind of bring it up. My mom has a great memory. My grandma had an amazing memory. Like she had 12 kids or 13 kids and 50 grandkids knew everybody's birthdays, knew everybody's uh, wedding anniversaries. One of those people, you know? Yeah, amazing. So, so I, I kind of got a bit of that, but I'm also full of shit a lot. So I don't... Uh, <laughs> I can fake it really well. <laughs> oh yeah. So that works together. as well too. Anyways. Yeah. So I think that was probably the last time we saw you in Saskatoon. And uh but you and I were friends. Well, we got to know each other a little bit through when I was on the students council actually. And you were uh with the sheaf. You're a sheafy. Mm-hmm. Is that what you guys yeah. called yourselves? I don't even know what you called yourselves. What did we call ourselves? I don't know if we called ourselves anything. You guys are part of the uh, University of Saskatchewan newspaper. So the sheep is the name of it. So yeah. you were part of it and then you were the editor one year. Yeah. 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 The last, yeah. And then I was on the board the last year as at U of S. Okay. As well. But it's interesting to see the sheep. Like I was just saw a post today from Timothy Sawa, who's now at CBC. And Lorenda, like there's a whole bunch of people yeah, Lorenda. who yeah. still ended up doing a lot in journalism that um, that started out at the Sheaf. Tim Tim was the editor when I started and he was so great. He and Brooks were editor and they were both so inspiring and helpful. And yeah, Brooks is still Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember Tim. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, yeah, it was actually really, I don't know, it was a pretty well run newspaper, at least it was when I was there. It was pretty solid. Yeah, yeah, it was a good learning experience. And like Tim is doing great stuff in Toronto. I ran into him on the subway in Toronto. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was really weird, but yeah, he's he's doing investigative journalism. Like he was being sued by Peter Nygaard, I think. Personally oh, sued because of an investigation he was doing and it just recently got thrown out. That's the post I was reading and Miranda was commenting on it. That's great news, Tim. And it, like, so he's doing some great stuff at CBC on the national investigative uh, yeah you, you want to be sued by the right people right so <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. yeah for sure no that's that's how we know each other but actually it, it was interesting like our friendship really started though after jalair's jalair susie's wedding with andrew because yeah. um because jalair was on after her term with the sheep she worked with the students union and when I was on the students union, that was a full-time job for me. She and I became pretty good buddies. And then she got married at the end of that year. And you were there at the wedding. And then I needed a ride to Calgary. I think we were talking. And I was just done school. I had, didn't have a job or anything. I had nothing. <laughs> and you gave me a ride to Calgary. Oh, uh, yeah. If you recall. So when I moved to Calgary, you're the one that actually moved me there. And I had like a couple bags and a ghetto blaster and like that's it and my cds and that's it so amazing? the little amount that we used to move around with like i think about that too I, re I remember moving somewhere and i mailed two boxes in the mail i took them to the post office and mailed them and then just flew i think it was when i was coming back from uh from school in ontario to move back to the prairies yeah the moves were so simple yeah it was like man how am i gonna move all this stuff it's like takes up half a seat in, the, in your little car so that's that's kind of how we know each other there and then you were going to calgary so your background was in journalism like uh 
do you have an English degree or something? I think you had an English degree, didn't you? Or what'd you get? Well, I did a psych degree at U of S. Okay. And then um, I was interested in doing something else because psych was pretty competitive. Like I was interested in it, but to do a graduate degree and it would have been, it was so competitive to get in. It was more competitive than medicine, if I remember correctly. Wow. So you really had to go have good marks. So um, I did want to do a master. So I did this like one year master of arts at uh, Western oh, in okay. London, Ontario for yeah. journalism. So it was an MA in journalism. So that's how I started, I graduated there and then I got an internship in Edmonton for four months in the springtime after, like it was a one year program, spring to spring. So we graduated in the spring and then I moved to Edmonton for four months and it was great. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was a newspaper and I, after working in a newspaper, I'm like, I really, really want to do radio. I want to work at CBC. I want to try to see if I can work at CBC. It's hard to get yeah. a job there. But that's when I moved to Calgary because I had friends there I could live with and, and try to, you know, get some experience, just job shadow at CBC, that kind of thing. And then when we, right. when I was living there, we, that's when we, you were on Memorial, right? You were living on Memorial. Oh yeah. Briefly. Yeah. Yeah. For a little while. Yeah. This first place I lived actually, my cousin was there sleeping on his couch in the right. sunny side. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful neighborhood though. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> great by the water. I remember yeah. we went for a walk or two down there, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That summer, yeah. Then I moved to a little, uh, to downtown uh, at the end of summer. So yeah. I forgot about and that. Then, yeah. When did you move after that? Well, I lived downtown with my brother, and then then I moved in with a roommate over in Martelloup for a year, and then I got a place of my own just south of downtown in Mission, so on Fourth Street. A couple years later, though. Um, and south of 17th. So I've lived in all the really trendy neighborhoods in Calgary. It was yeah, I was going to say, the, the top neighborhoods in Calgary, you've lived in all of them. Yeah, they all had original Joe's like two blocks away or so. So I really enjoyed that part of it. So yeah, that, that was a cool summer. Well, it's kind of nice for me anyways, because well, maybe for you too, because I was like, I was a free agent. And it was kind yeah. of, you don't get a lot of those opportunities for freedom and I didn't have a lot of responsibility either. So mm -hmm. I just look for work and I went to the library every day, read books and I found a park and then read books and hung out. It was a great place to be, to be honest. So it yeah, was, it's Calgary's a great place. It is. I, I miss it still. It's it's great. So when did you leave Calgary? Like what year? Two thousand eight. Okay. I got my job at uh Camico in two thousand eight and it was, I was kind of done with seismic. I was doing seismic and I was done with it. So, um, yeah, and, and I like Saskatoon. Saskatoon's a great town and I really enjoy my time in university there. And I found Calgary was just a little bit too big. And if you're married and you want to start a family, you have to, yeah, you have to live far away or, or be happy with something really small close to the center. I didn't want either. So Saskatoon's more affordable and it's easy to get around. Yeah, and, totally. uh, there, and we have a cabin. Amber's mom has a cabin north of town that we were able to take advantage of every every summer we're there. Oh, uh, which lake is it at? Iroquois Lake. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Maybe I have to bleep oh. it out. Okay. But it's <laughs> but it's north of <laughs> it's north of Blaine Lake uh, by Shell oh. Lake. Nice. So it's about an hour and a half from, from town. Yeah, it's just perfect. Like. We can whip up there on a Friday afternoon right after work if we want. And for a while, like when Amber's kids were really young, I'd stay till Monday morning, get up early and then go to work right from there. Like it wasn't, you could do that, you know? Um, yeah. That's quiet. doesn't have a lot of amenities, which is what we like. And uh, it's beachfront too. Mm -hmm. So it's right on the beach. And... Oh, that's the best. Yeah. So that's, that's why we left. I think it's a fair trade off too. I miss Calgary. I miss because they have, you get a lot more uh, shows. I miss NHL hockey. I miss, uh, oh, yeah. uh, and they have, I don't know, they, they have a lot more amenities, but honestly, what do you need? Like we have no, everything exactly. need here. So it's, it's like perfect. wherever you live, you kind of create your own, like, yeah, it doesn't really matter where you live. Yeah. I agree with you. Like, but, and those shows and things like Jeff and I have talked about this because those shows and things are things that you think like, cause we lived in Toronto for 10 years before we moved to Copenhagen and yeah. When we first moved to Toronto, we were really good about going out to things, but eventually 
you just kind of stop being so good at it and you just like and also like what we liked about Saskatoon or Winnipeg where we lived before that was right. there there was less there were fewer shows but they were like everyone went to them so you could like go together with people right like there was more it's like the whole streaming versus a point in television thing like now everyone's watching every different show so you kind of can't share that experience that's an interesting point yeah so we found that like we we I mean, Jeff was better at going and then we had small kids. So I was also like, I just want to sleep. So you just go, please. <laughs> I can't go up. <laughs> yeah, that's the other part of it. Like if you're like, again, no kids, it'd be, it might be different anyways, right? But uh, yeah, that's kids true. It and that's fine. But that's, that's what, because we don't go very much anymore. Though. Although whether we, when we go, it's a special event. And, yeah, exactly. You, know. you appreciate it in a different way. And, and there's nothing like, it's not like you're missing out. Like I always felt like, yeah, I really <laughs> wanted to stay home with him, right? Yeah. So it was okay. It, it didn't feel like I was. Plus, I guess when you, like, we both got married in our thirties, right? So yeah. you've had like a lot of time to do all of those things. Like, you're not feeling like you're starving for it. So. No, I I left that all on the floor. It's there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no regrets in that regard. I'm it's gone. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. you you were a journalist for a while. You're uh, you're a radio journalist producer. More, yeah. more so, right? Um, as a, yeah, a producing but, journalist is what you were, I guess. So, I, yeah, we did like it, it was in Saskatchewan, um, in Regina. I was there for four years, yeah, working. And I started out as an associate producer, but quickly found because it's a small um plant, as they call it in CBC terms, but a small like a regional station, they don't have, say, for as many um staff members as, say, like national shows in Toronto and stuff like that. So mm. there were fewer people that were staff and that meant I got to fill in for people when they go on holidays. So I got to direct the show. I got to produce the show. Wow. I got to start yeah. to host the shows. I hosted the morning show. I hosted the afternoon show. I hosted the weekend morning show. And that was really ex mm -hmm. exceptionally good experience. Like for example, the weekend morning show had one mm. staff member and it was me. So I was the tech person. I got the sports in the morning. I got the weather in the morning. I wrote all the con all the scripts during the week for the weekend show because it was three hours live Saturday Holy and Sunday. Crap. So wow. it was amazing experience because you really you just get you learn by doing there because yeah. there aren't as many people and it was and there's great people. I mean the people I worked with were amazing. I'm still in touch with them and um, yeah it was it was amazing to work there. So yeah, that's yeah, the only reason I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, the only reason we left was because Jeff got a job in Winnipeg, and so I moved to CBC Winnipeg, which was great. But um, yeah, yeah, and and CBC Winnipeg again, wonderful people and and really really good experiences. So it was good. Yeah. CBC was good. Well, before you leave Regina, I'm gonna recount that time that I gave you a call. I left you a message at in Regina at your office. And Did. You know, yeah, you know this. So okay. I went, I, I was going to go see Dave Matthews in Las Vegas with a buddy. Ah, yeah, and yeah. then, um, so from Calgary, yeah, yeah. and I was going to take a big long trip. I was going to drive down. And at the last minute, buddy, he's, I don't want to do, I don't want to go see Dave Matthews. I'm like, I was a huge Dave Matthews band fan. I've never seen him. I want to go see him. And you don't want to go. So I was like, screw it. And then actually, I ran to this girl I knew from Rez in the bar the night before. Hey, do you want to go to Vegas with me? I have a free ticket. I'm just going. So like, yeah, let's go next morning. She's like, I don't want to go. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to go on my own. So I drove to Vegas on my own. And it was a 20-hour drive. I did it in 22 hours. So I stopped for like two hours to have a nap. That was it. Stupid idea. I was like, who the hell do I know in Vegas? I was like, Katie's mom and dad are there. Because <laughs> yes. your mom, was, she was doing her master's, I believe, in uh, yeah. creative writing. She's a poet. Your mom's a poet. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are. This is before the anybody had cell phones or anything. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I'm gonna phone Katie up. So I get to my hotel. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> I call up CBC Regina. Okay, I wanna. I wanna talk to Katie Andrews. <laughs> and he weren't there. But I'm like, okay, I left him. message. Okay, Katie, this is stupid. But I'm in Vegas, and I have an extra ticket to see Dave Matthews Band. And I, I, I don't know anyone in Vegas. Your parents are there. I don't know if they want to meet up or something. I forget what the message was. And then I crashed. I fell asleep. And then three hours later, I get a phone call. It's your dad. Hey, like, 
hey, I'm Katie's dad. And so <laughs> it was awesome because the show was like the next night. So I had a night. So I just hung out by myself. And the next day, your dad picked me up. We went out to Red Rock Canyon. We went out to the Hoover Dam. Oh. And we just had just the nicest day. And I was like, I was going to go scalp the ticket. I was like, do you want to go to the show with me? And he, he was a drummer, he said, when he was younger. He was a drummer. So I said, well, come to the show with me. He's like, oh, well, I'm like, you'll have fun. So we went and we had went to a concert together. He was a great guy and we had a fun time. Okay, I knew that. And I stayed at, your, at their house that night too. You stayed, at, I knew you stayed there, but I didn't remember the part about my dad going to the concert with you, but it doesn't surprise yeah. me because yeah, he's in, he, he's still drumming. Like he's still in a band. That's hilarious. So, he's a nice guy. That's so cool. But yeah. yeah I'm glad. Red Rocks is so beautiful, right? Yeah, oh. I got I got the insider tour of, of uh, the Las Vegas area. It was it was so cool. Like out an outside, like not the strip, but like what do locals want to go see or do? And they said Red Rocks Canyon, that's the place, right? So yeah, that's true. And then your mom made me pancakes and a nice breakfast the next morning. Aw. So I was so like, I have, I have Vegas parents. This is great. Yeah, you do, <laughs> but no, no longer, Rob. They don't live there anymore. No, I figure not. They must have moved. Where are they? Where are your parents now? Well, they they left Vegas. Oh, what year would that have been? They were there for a full ten years. I no, oh, okay. No, maybe less. No, maybe less actually. I'm I'm. But a long time though, hey. Like four or five years, and okay. then because yeah, my mom had to do the masters, and that takes a while. So uh they moved they were going to move to calgary they were okay. driving to calgary they um but they first went to see my dad's parents in abbotsford which is near vancouver yeah and uh they they also just like put their stuff in storage or got it shipped and then they were they were driving yeah and they were driving and like when you said you drove 20 hours to get there like that sounds a lot like my dad so i'm sure you guys hit it off that <laughs> you're very much awesome. alike <laughs> oh yeah we talked music and oh, it was so cool yeah. yeah 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 and so they were driving to calgary but they stopped in this little mountain town called nelson which is in the kootenays yeah i'm tree planted there yeah yeah oh yeah so you know did yeah. you tree plant in fort nelson though like north north no no was Nel nelson here? nelson was awesome that's where they made the movie roxanne it's awesome yes okay so that's where <laughs> my parents live and the story is they were on their way to Calgary and they stopped there for one night and they're like, we're in this place. It's so great. It's called Nelson. It's really cool. Like, oh, great. And then they were like, we're going to stay for a week. Okay. And then uh, the next time we talked to them, they were like, oh, we rented an apartment here. <laughs> we're going to stay here for a month. Like, well, that's really great. And the next time we, talked yeah. to them, we bought a townhouse here. We're going to live here. <laughs> Like they oh my god <laughs> are your parents hippies because that's where a lot of hippies went hey was nelson yeah they're kind of a bit not hip like they're the hippies yeah. who don't drink or do drugs right like they're yeah okay that's that 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 actually sounds about right yeah with them yeah no because because they're being on the hippie place and it's weird nelson was like this little island in the middle of you know very conservative yeah. british columbia interior but they're all these uh i think they had a lot of uh, draft dodgers and those kind of people came up there during the war uh, Vietnam War and they stayed settled in that location for whatever reason it's a little strange little eclectic town I remember like mm -hmm. back now it's probably not a big deal but back then there was like pot shops everywhere oh yeah back in in 95 or so it's like you never saw that anywhere but in Nelson they were like that was kind of the way it was right so as a university kid I was like oh it's the coolest place ever but uh, <laughs> so, where, so how? Which summer was that that you tree planted there? I would have tree planted there in ninety five, uh, ninety six, ninety six. Yeah, okay. yeah. I've tried to tree planted both those years, but ninety six is when I was in uh, oh. Nelson for a few weeks too. So beautiful little town. Cool. Anyways, so yeah, we, so, yeah. Sorry. I was just gonna say we both. I also tree planted, but I tree planted in northern Saskatchewan, like Blaine oh, Lake, yeah. northern Blaine Lake ish. Yeah. That area. Yeah, big river and uh, those kind of yeah, areas. big river exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's again, that's where their lake is up there. It's pretty nice. We're just south of the uh, the bush, so like big river is kind of into the bush, and we're sort of still in the prairie part of okay. it. So we're still a bit of a prairie lake. So that's good. Well, say hi to your mom, dad, for me. You know, I may I have will. to stop by for some pancakes sometime. So <laughs> you should, you should. They'd love to meet Amber and the boys. <laughs> oh, they're nice people. So anyways, yeah, so Jeff, uh, Jeff's in, is he marketing or what, what's his kind of uh, career? Yeah, and he's done pretty well in that too. Like he's, he's, you guys have moved around and yeah, moving yeah, up the chain a bit. 
it's really the reason we're in Copenhagen is because he was working for a Danish company in Toronto. Oh, the last okay. Few years. And so it was just like they said, you know, if you want to go to the head office, it's in Copenhagen. And we just didn't have hesitation, really. So <laughs> we're like, yes, let's do it. Wow, that's amazing. I had no idea. So how long have you guys been in Copenhagen? We moved here April 2019. Oh, not long then. Not too long. Okay. No, not long at all. And we thought maybe two years is what we originally thought pre-pandemic. Um, because then Max could finish um, grade eight here and start high school with his friends next year yeah. in grade nine in Toronto. So now, but we're not so sure now because part of our reason for coming here was really to show the kids Europe and just show, show ourselves Europe <laughs> yeah. and like enjoy that and, and also have guests come and like be able to hang out with them. And so, um, so we're going to, we're going to feel it out and see, and Max is open to, you know, coming back for grade 10 to Toronto. So, that's kind of what we're thinking now. Our timeline has shifted by a year. So three years in Copenhagen before we go yeah. back. But we'll for, kid, for kids, I actually talked this with my friend, my last video I did too. For kids, time seems a lot longer than it is for for, for us mm -hmm. grownups or older people, especially. So for Max, it might seem like a long time, but really another year is, is it'll go by pretty quick. He'll still have his buddies and yeah. uh, be able to experience that. But, you know, living in Europe, for free for his sake <laughs> is uh yeah exactly. you know it doesn't happen all the time so and uh you get to learn travel to different places meet different people so you just sort of different a little bit different way of seeing things and i'm jealous that's, that's good, for, good for you guys that are able to do that well come visit when it's when it's safe to you guys should all come we have room for you all four of you for sure and it's it is a fun place to go with families it's a very family friendly place and um easy to get around lots of like the I think as an engineer engineering background right mm -hmm. like you would find it fascinating some of the stuff that just the building yeah. that they've done and like the like there's underground tunnels like underwater to like we take if we take the train to Sweden we take we go on a bridge like with water on either side of us and then we go under a tunnel underwater yes to Sweden. it's really cool it's like oh and it's yeah. all the train systems are ridiculously affordable and convenient and yeah it's good everything's close by um yeah you know well this is the thing you don't realize how big canada is until you come to a place like this right you're like yeah it's uh canada's just so incredibly vast and <laughs> it's amazing well i know that because after i visited your parents in vegas i flew over to halifax visited friends there and then i took the train oh. across the country so I, I'm going to do that. I did that once. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> That's a long <laughs> trip, man. Holy Christ. It took like three days to get across the country. To Saskatoon only. So that is not even to, uh, I didn't go to the BC coast or anything. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a very different world. I've never actually been to Europe. So um, and if I have friends in Europe like you there when I go, I, you know I'm going to be stopping in and saying hello for sure. So for sure, you I don't should. know if we're going to be able to do that, but... I know. I know. We'll have to see, but it's, well, Jeff's very hopeful because he does work in the pharmaceutical area and marketing, and he's really hopeful about the vaccine and the rollout and how it's going to change things. So we're talking about it for the last few months. Yeah, we're talking about it for the last few months. <laughs> well, no, but it, you know, people always bitch about big pharma, but I'm like, okay, but who's stepping up now? It's big pharma, and this is why we have big pharma. This is why we pay big pharma to do the things they yeah. do. Come up with solutions like this, right? Yeah. And we don't appreciate it until we need them. And now they're there and they're all, it's not just one company, it's a bunch of companies. And it's probably more than those companies too, right? They probably have their associates in other, say smaller firms or specialty type firms. And they're, yeah. uh, they're stepping up and like, good. I appreciate that. So and, we're going to see. Yeah. As we know, like this, you rely on the scientific method, right? Like you can't, so they're going to study drugs. And if there's a drug that, is not safe they're, they could sink billions into it and if uh you know if it's not safe then the, all that money is just gone they have to start over so yeah you know people talk about yeah i mean i know people are critical and stuff but there is that there's the whole behind the scenes how it works that if people understood a bit more about the business yeah. side of it like any business you're going to have losses and you have to kind of yeah you're not just paying for the drug you're getting you're paying for the drugs that you're not getting 
and, and that's good part point. of the process, right? That's so, a good way to, that's a really good way to put it. Well, yeah, it's like exactly. oil exploration is the same thing. Like you're not going to hit every well. And so, you, but you still have to pay for that well. And the oil that you pay for, or you get paid for it, it pays for the, the losses that you incur as well too. Like it's a risk like anything else. And yeah. we don't, we don't understand that. And with pharma, like it's, it's all manpower and, and just, you know, scientific knowledge, like people sitting down there doing their calculations, doing the testing over and over and over again. It's not an efficient way to do things, but that's the only way we can do it to make sure that it's safe and, you know, exactly. done properly. Right. Like you, you can make it quicker and we can make it cheaper. That's not a problem. <laughs> it may not, be, it may not work. It may not be safe. Right. Yeah. It might not be safe. So yeah. when you said you brought out of seismic what happened there like what what me and smart move by the way a couple years <laughs> you dodged a bullet <laughs> yeah well i thought about it and it was going pretty hardcore there i'll tell you like because I, I did seismic and i have a degree in engineering and so my job is to create seismic maps for oil companies like we were service companies so we created this seismic maps and they use that to, to you know, build their drilling programs it doesn't tell you exactly where oil is but it tells you the this has the proper structure that makes it very more likely that oil's there. That's why you drill here, not here, because the map says the structure is here. That's why you drill there. And uh, it, may, it may not be oil, but it limits your risk. Um, but I, I saw that it used to be very uh, computer intensive, well, still is, and also labor intensive. There's, it was a lot of artist, artistry with uh, geophysics. <laughs> Because you're you're combining math with art, so you're, you're there's a bit of a leeway with uh, you have to have an experience to be able to say no, this is not right. I know this isn't right, and this is why through my experience at this waveform, it's uh, some sort of artifact that's artificial that's not doesn't reflect the actual geology down there. But I noticed though, there's more and more people who didn't have degrees who are doing this, and I noticed our programs are getting better and better and better. So uh, that, that was telling me mm -hmm. there's going to be an end to this. Like I'm not going to be valued as much. And we also noticed like, cause you got paid by shot, like geophysics are, they shoot, they blast holes in the ground. So you get paid by the shot, the shot record. And I noticed that the, the price per record was going down slightly, slightly down, even over five years, I noticed that because yeah. their computing capacity was getting better. It's more and more efficient. Well, there's only so much data that's out there. So, so I was like, you know, I'm, we're going to get priced out of here. And, and we're always going to need people to be able to do this, but not everyone's going to be wanting to do this. And I don't really enjoy it. <laughs> nah. <laughs> it was go. boring. I was sitting in front of the computer screen all day, like clicking mouse. And yeah, that's, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I need that interaction. I need to talk to people. So I got out. So, well, I got laid off because our company was whatever. I don't know, doing what it was doing. But I was happy to go. Like at first, it was a huge shock, but because it kind of you don't expect that coming. Yeah, you want it to work, but it just didn't work. But the next day, I was like, man, I'm so glad to be gone. I don't have to be there anymore. And then I got into communications. That's what I got into for uh, a mining company. And I didn't know you switched to communications. I, I, that's so cool. Good for you. Yeah, it was technical communications. I, I kind of pursued this company because they're kind of a larger company and they're a nu nuclear company. I'm a big nu advocate of nuclear because it's uh, such a cool energy source. And Saskatchewan is like a world leader in development of, of uranium. And uh, so I kind of pursued them and I, and I kind of told them, this is like during the nuclear renaissance, as they called it, before Fukushima, where everybody was expanding nuclear. But I, mm -hmm. but it's like, I, I, I want to, I want a job with you guys. And so the first I got interviewed to be an, a geophysicist and they asked me, could I do that? I'm like, yes, I could do it. I don't want to do it though. This is what I can do. And a few months later, I get another call and I said, maybe they, they have a role for me. And so my job became a technical communication specialist. So I was able to explain science and engineering into English and ah. I get to work on my writing skills and, uh, Work with uh, Gord Struthers, who was a uh, former editor of the Star Phoenix newspaper. He was nice. my mentor, and he was—he's an old—he's one of those old journals, right? Like mm -hmm. hard smoking, likes his you know likes his booze and stuff like that. But like a hell of an editor. The guy was amazing, and he just he ripped apart you know documents and just streamlined them, and he just taught me everything I need to know about editing. Like I'm a really good editor now because of him. So I did that for a number of years and I, so I help with our regulatory 
submissions. So we had to submit to the Nuclear Safety uh, Commission all the time. And my job was to help streamline and, and uh, the writing and make it like it all, because we had different sites that were all licensed separately. So they all kind of used to do their own things. And our job was to bring it together from a corporate kind of point of view. So they were all in it together. So that everything was consistent. And then at the same time, we also did public engagement with Northerners because um, we had to do that. That was a huge part of our job too. And again, all these different sites would go and do their public engagement, but like they're kind of, they're all over the map in terms of the quality and their messaging. So I was there helping craft messages. So there's a very consistent feel throughout. Mm -hmm. And like, this is how you talk to people, right? Like mm -hmm. is that fine line between like, you know, talking down to them because you don't want to do that, but you also don't want to like talk about their heads, treat them like yeah. they're smart people, but don't, don't embarrass them or condescend to them. So it was a very fine line, especially because there's a very proud people up North, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, they're there because that's where they want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you know, it was an interesting job. Yeah, I liked it a lot. That's cool. That's good yeah. You. And then was that, and then you're in something new now? Well, then Fukushima oh. happened. So Fukushima really yeah. devastated the nuclear industry, which kind of bugs me because it wasn't a nuclear accident. It was a tsunami <laughs> that, mm. that uh, you know, it, it caused some uh, disruption to the Fukushima plant, but a lot of it was actually due to the design of the the backup systems, the, the reactor itself was fine until the backup systems got overwhelmed by the, the waters. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that, then the, the reactor itself overloaded and the new designs don't have that, but that, that was the design with that. But it yeah. scared a lot of people off of nuclear, which is kind mm -hmm. of unfortunate because it's, it's the only really large scale, low carbon energy source outside of hydro and you can't build dams anymore. So so anyways, they, after a couple of years, you know, we, we saw the light and was, the, the, the industry is going through a huge contraction. So people started being let go. And, and for me, they wanted to keep me there. A bunch of us, they wanted to keep us there, but there's just no role for us anymore. So they moved us out. So then I, I got moved into become a uh, security guy. So, so I'm a corporate, became a corporate security guy. I don't oh, know. Wow. So <laughs> what was that like? Well, I tell for a libertarian, it's a little, uh, <laughs> some adjustment to it, but, um, I worked like I, when I was doing my writing and communications, I was working a lot with the safety health environment group and security is under that group. So that's why they put me there. Cause I had a relationship with the people in that group already. So, um, it's okay though. It gives you lots of freedom in terms of what I do. Cause nobody really, nobody wants to do security, but everybody knows that it's important. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I kind of find my own way and I kind of do my own thing for a while. And, but then we've had some more contractions and we've had retirements where they, you know, and contractions by attrition. So when people retire, they just don't fill the positions anymore. So more and more stuff keeps getting added. And that's kind of, it's kind of where we are right now. So it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes because I'm taking on like multiple portfolios at this point. And it's tough mm -hmm. in my mind to kind of keep it straight. And all I really want to do is talk to people. <laughs> yeah. All <laughs> right. You know, that's all I really want to do. So. So it's a bit of a thing. So what this project has been part of what it's doing, I'm relating to people, but I'm also kind of trying to use my skill set in communicating and talking with people and listening to people and and look for stories. I'm looking for stories right now. I'm not yeah. just I'm not sharing my story, but I want to know your story. I don't know part of it, but like we haven't talked for 10 years or whatever it's been. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Definitely. So that's kind of I am. And then so because like you, you've been going through that a little bit yourself too because you guys mm -hmm. moved to toronto you got into cbc toronto no well. actually or no so speaking of layoffs i was laid off at cbc winnipeg okay um, the first day the first day i came back from my maternity leave i was laid off okay. um nice. again but it was at, it was also a blessing in disguise because i'd always wanted to do something different and when yeah. i was on maternity leave with max i really i really enjoyed being at home and i really felt like uh, this is a limited time that I'll have with him until he goes to school. And yeah. my, I just felt like I could go back to CBC and I could get, you know, get up at four in the morning some days and do the early shift and then other days have to get up later and try and juggle that with a small child. And I didn't, it, before I had kids, it was fine. But once he was around, I thought, mm, I don't think that's, I have lots of friends who did it. And I think they, that was the right choice for them. And I'm so happy that, 
there are supports for women to do exactly what they want to do. But for yeah. me, it felt like it wasn't the right thing. So I was happy to, you know, say eventually after some arbitration, get, get the proper um, package from CBC because they didn't yes. want to give me anything. No. <laughs> um, anyways, but that's a long story, but then I, in, while I was on maternity, that first year, I spent a lot of time at the library also to go to the kids section. And I just started, you know, like probably like you, I always had summer jobs, you know, starting when you're 16, you're always working and then you're in school and then university, you're studying so hard and then you're working all summer and you're just always like occupied yeah. mentally. And I felt like maternity leave was the first time where sure I was completely exhausted, but completely <laughs> exhilarated to hang out with a newborn, right? Because they're so incredible to watch. It's just, there's nothing else as amazing as it. That's a crazy um, time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy time, but it's also it pushes you to your limits physically, but mm -hmm. you could, you can read and you can, by then podcasts were around and like, you can listen to podcasts, you can read, maybe they were just actually, maybe not podcasts, but I was listening to a lot of Q on CBC and that was always inspiring. So there's a lot of artists on there and I started learning about screenwriting and I thought, I think this is what I wanted to do with my life, but I didn't know it was possible growing up in Saskatoon. I thought if yeah. I want to be a writer, I have to be, I think probably a journalist. If I want to be doing stuff on television or, you know, in media, I think I have to be a journalist. I don't think there's anything else that's kind of like that. So I started yeah. doing research about screenwriting and I, when Max was two, I took an online, a one year online course from UCLA um, digitally. And it was really great. It was wow. like Skype with instructors and then writer, the diff eight different writers from, they were, I think all American except for me. Um, but we shared our writing each week and mm -hmm. uh, we had a great instructor. I'm still friends with, he's a great guy. He works with Pixar and Disney and wow. he produces movies and he's a writer himself, really great guy. Um, and he was a great teacher. And mm. so we did this one year program together and I wrote two movie scripts in that time, like through, through the course, which was great. And after that, I just, uh, Wow. Thought I want to do this. And it's kind of one of those things where you, I'm in a blessed situation because Jeff had a full-time job and I was able to be a mom and just do little bits of it and, um, you know, not mm -hmm. be so worried about money the way, I mean, not everyone has that luxury, but I was able to. And so yeah. I just started doing little things, wrote some short scripts and I met a guy who wanted to direct one of them. And they made that movie in Toronto. It was just a little mini, like, okay. I think it was six minutes long. And I just kept doing those short short things and a few of them have been produced. And then um, I got to do a really great web series, which was episodic, which was really, you actually, you should watch it. I think you might think it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's the guy who created it's from PEI, but I feel there's a lot of similarities between PEI people and Saskatchewan people in terms of their sensibility. Yeah. So I noticed that in my student union days when I was traveling out there, people from well, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI. Yeah. Like, yeah. Us and, and the Prairie people hung out together. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of yeah. optimized the Ontario people. Quebec people weren't even around. And BC were all getting high somewhere. So it was us. Yeah. And, yeah. and the no. BC people were like, when are you going to move to Vancouver? When are yeah. you going to move to Vancouver? <laughs> They're in their own should, little world. And we like them. But, uh, <laughs> I know. It is a beautiful place. I mean, for yeah. sure. But not everyone can move there, guys. I mean, no. capacity. No. You're at capacity already. <laughs> But you're right, though, about uh, that sensibility, though, and um, you saw that, like, say, with Corner Gas as an example of a, of a series that really captured that small town sort of mindset and this community mindset, and it was such a, or not, pra prairie mindset's probably a better way of uh, putting it, and uh, you see a lot of that also in out, out east there, too, so, or even, like, yeah. with Letterkenny as well, like, it's small town Ontario, yeah. it's the same thing, though, like, it's, that's true. That's a goofy very true. way of looking at the world, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so anyways, is, yeah. Okay. It's great. Yeah. It was called you, Just Passing Through. Just Passing it's, Through. Uh, yeah. Just Passing Through.ca, and you can watch all of it on there. It's free. Like, but it's really, um, I thought it was just really smart. And the guy, uh, Jeremy, who created it, he produced the first season and, and he put out a call for writers for the second season. Um, and he just said, you know, write a sample of our show send me a couple of scripts with our characters and tell you know what what happened next after the the last episode of season one so i did that and he said he said you're well come on board and there was lots of other great writers that uh, were doing it we all we did it all on google docs we never met in person we all wrote episodes and 
Uh, he had a bit of funding, so he paid us a little bit, which was nice. And it was just such a great experience. And it's such a funny show. And um, yeah, it's just a really, really, really good show. I mean, it's really, you can't watch it at work. It's tons of <laughs> profanity and <laughs> stuff like that. But it's okay. really smart. I'll put it's my really headphones smart. on when I watch it then. then. <laughs> yes, definitely. Not around the kids. <laughs> um, but it's just smart yeah. humor and, and uh, again, like very prairie kind of like uh, not too full of himself, you know, that kind of stuff. Like just yeah. really fun. That's a good way to get expand your writing chops though, right? To work on a real live project that it's, mm -hmm. it's getting published and it's getting released, right? And people are watching it and you can see how it works, right? And, and you can see what doesn't work as well, right? And it's yeah. sort of a low stakes, but just such great reward in, in developing that, right? So it's true. And it's yeah. just like everything, the people you work with are really great. Um, it makes it great. And he was a really right. good, he was a writer himself and as well as a director. And he just was really great to just get great feedback. And yeah. So that was a really good, that was mm. a turning point for me because through that project, I met another writer who I co wrote a script with who introduced me to, um, one of his friends who I was kind of interested at that point in getting into something called script supervision, yes. which, yeah. So in Toronto, there was a lot of production happening. So not just Canadian mm. stuff, but also American stuff comes up there to shoot. And um, it would be like working on set. It's, ca it's called the continuity person really, but they do a lot more than that. They try and it's not just about like the water glass always being this full when you come back, you know, first you shoot one person and then you you know set up and you shoot the at the person coming this way and everything on the table should be in the same spot but sometimes it happens like hours after the initial shot so it's yeah. like that whole thing of keeping everything looking right on screen and um and a whole bunch of other things like there's much more to it than that so i really was interested in that and this guy i worked with on just passing through said i have a friend who does that she's working with orphan black right now doing that you should oh, yeah. meet her Melanie. So I met with her and she was great. And I worked on a script for her. It never got, it never went anywhere, but we, it was a short um, idea she wanted to direct herself. Um, and then through her, she introduced me to Virginia, who's the director of the movie that's just out now. So yeah. it was like the whole networking thing is so true, right? You just meet people, hear about what they're working on. So what had happened with Melanie is she knew I was a writer looking to to write movies and she and Virginia were friends and she knew Virginia was looking for okay. a writer to work on this project. And she's like, why don't you guys meet? And we met and it was just, that was know, three years ago now. I can't think how long, probably at least yeah. oh, more than that. Um, yeah, four years ago. And then we just kind of started working one day a week on this movie and, and then other things too. We have a TV show that we've worked on together that's, you know, we're still trying to sell or trying to get made, but Okay. Um, the collaboration thing with her has been amazing. She's just a really great person and she's such a, she just gets stuff done. She just, I don't know anyone who works as hard or like, she just will never give up. <laughs> like no matter which obstacles come her way, she's like, we're going to get this done. And she just does it in a way where she's so kind to everyone and inclusive mm. and everyone who works on her productions, you know, like she had su such high caliber people working on this movie and everyone worked um, for free, essentially. They all work in Toronto. They've been working in, in you know, Murdoch Mysteries and all these other shows. They've all, they all work on those shows. Yeah. But they wanted to do this trip with Virginia because she's great. It's her project she wanted to do. And they got to go to the Azores, which is- um, I was going to say, off the that, that, <laughs> yeah. that's not bad. Yeah. Is that what Adam Sandler does? He does his productions. He does his stupid little movies, but he goes to Hawaii or whatever. He takes all his buddies yeah. and they have fun doing it, right? Exactly. So there's nothing wrong. So you get that. That's that's a benefit anyways. But um, yeah, it's get true. him out of Toronto for a while. So yeah. I was gonna, I was going to get you though. How did you, did you meet uh, Virginia? So that, that's, uh, that answers that question. So yeah. Um, yeah, I find that kind of a very, very interesting though, just the way things evolve and, and, you may, just by making yourself available and mm -hmm. giving an indication of what you're capable of, you know, these things kind of exactly and, and keep keep your options yeah. open. And all of a sudden, these connections can happen. And you see that a lot more in the sort of the arts field or the movies yeah. field. So yeah, I'm really, true. yeah, I remember when I was talking to you last, you were mentioning you were getting into screenwriting, and I thought that that was really cool because you've always been a very creative person, right? Mm -hmm. Um you were always writing anyways, right? It wasn't just about journalism. Yeah. You were actually more mm -hmm. interested, in my mind, in the craft of 
creating a story yeah. anyways. So I was like, yeah. yeah, good luck to you if you can do this. I was, I was happy yeah. for you. I thought that was, well, it's a risk, but. Yeah. Well, it's like it's, it's, kind of, it's a challenge more than a risk, I think. Challenge, and it's like a lifetime um, vocation. You know what I mean? Like you can just keep getting better at it and you can do it by yourself. And you can do it anywhere as I'm finding here, right? Like I'm yeah. working on a project. I'm doing, writing something now and it's for a, a company in LA. So it's, it's fine. We do Zooms or whatever when we need to talk, but mostly I'm by myself and I can get email notes from them about what this, the draft, how it's looking, stuff like that. So it's, it's a great career for that. And to be like able to move around the other side of it is moving here has been really like to be as a writer, I feel like being in new places and stimulating and learning about a new, new ways of doing things is really yeah. stimulating, and really helpful as well. So, yeah. You just it's use uh, Google Docs still as well, Google yeah. Docs, or do you have a uh, writing uh, software that you use? Oh, yeah. Well, actually for the Google Docs stuff, we were doing that when we were breaking the story. Yeah. They say so like all the work that goes before you write the script where you're like, what should happen in here? What should happen with this character? What happens with this character's story? Like, how is it going to end? All that stuff. That's mm -hmm. where the Google Docs stuff came in. And I find for me, like figuring that stuff out is the hardest and takes some time but once you know that's when the script really can work really well and of course you explore during drafts you write your first draft and you're like oh this isn't working we need to change this but you go back and revise that document and try and figure out better connections or make things feel more more real or more organic like organic that. exactly yeah. organic but uh, yeah, so now I, yeah, I do use Final Draft um, most of the time, which is Final good. Drafts, yeah. I started using Ulysses as my writing aid and it, it's cool because just the way it organizes it, it's just easy to kind of move, just put everything in sections, just move things around a lot easier that way. I just find it. Really? Okay. It outputs it all in any kind of format you want to do. So I do a lot of blogging or I used to do a lot of blogging and I would use that for my sort of my longer essays and it was easy, easy to use, so. Cool. I'll have to check out your blog. I wasn't aware of this. Well, I read under a, a pseudonym, so. <laughs> okay. Well, just send me the link then, <laughs> so I can check it out. Yeah, I can do that for you. It, it's actually because I was big into Game of Thrones, um, the books actually, uh -huh. A Song of Ice and Fire, and I found there's a lot of really great symbolism in there, and I didn't. You have to read it a few times, and you all of a sudden realize what he's the author is doing there. He's actually creating sort of a sub narrative of uh mythology actually within this world that mm -hmm. keeps revealing itself through the characters and, and story arcs and you're like why like why all these guys have one eye all these different characters have one eye like that's weird but he's actually yeah. creating sort of a mythology of a character who has one eye sort of an odin-esque character mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. lives in these weirwoods and he's like a magician type stuff but like the, the story keeps revealing itself but the author steals a lot from mythologies and religions that are out there. And I find that very interesting. Yeah. And so what stories are you telling? And there's all, and then because these mythologies in, in our world, they have a psychological and meaning that's embedded in them as well too. Like the not just arbitrary, they, they're there mm -hmm. because they actually are telling something about ourselves and the way we view the world. Mm -hmm. So by recognizing that you're trying to think, what is George Martin? What is he trying to tell you using these mythologies yeah. about his world? So I find that very fascinating. So I started writing essays on that. Oh, and that's cool. Yeah, it's kind wow. of stupid and fun and I love it. So it takes my mind oh. off things. Although I kind of stopped last year, but now I'm actually working on a book. Um, What's your book about? Can you talk about it? Not a little bit. It's, it's about actually the, uh, the, the, the feminine archetype or the, the, the divine feminine in these stories so it's just it's just a researching these stories and by using looking at carl Jung, and but also looking at say the bible or greek myth or whatever else like this is where george martin's taking this kind of stuff this is what these myths actually mean and this is what the story george martin's put together in there because it's huge right like we talk about every time you see a dragon well that's actually a reminiscence of the feminine sort of the the terrible side of the feminine and by terrible i don't mean like the like she's terrible it means like the powerful destructive side uh, of the feminine but there's also the very the organic vegetative growth side of the feminine too that's also prevalent in the stories like with the trees and those kind of things those are usually 
based off the feminine in there as well too and then there's also like the wise crone or the the virgin these are all sort of different facets of that archetype and mm -hmm. i find it fascinating and i've been actually reading a lot about it and and now when i watch stories like like movies i see those archetypes there like oh i know exactly what that is i, I actually start speaking that kind of language i find that really fascinating now that yeah that, but by by doing it with this one series which has a whole you know the whole suite of every kind of symbol you can think about is all in there you start i can get to understand those patterns in my own life mm -hmm. and try to give it some meaning so that's what it's kind of about i haven't you, really talked to anybody about this before. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you read the christopher vogler book no but i'm going to now okay, yeah. <laughs> add it to my list of books that i read <laughs> I <have> <laughs> well there's a there's just some story. I also have um, a one about it's it's called the Virgin. It's got a kind of like a not very similar to the terrible you're talking about. The the name isn't very indicative of what it's about, but it's a, basically about a woman's journey as like a, a female character's journey. Like because the hero's journey is what Christopher Vogler and a lot of people talk about, um, and it's yeah. typically male. But yeah. this is kind of a look at uh, a different types of journeys that female characters take. So I'll send you a couple of, I mean, they're very screenwriting. So they're very like, you know, low level, like <laughs> anyone can understand them basically, which is fine <laughs> with me. Cause usually you can take yeah. a complex idea. If you can distill a complex idea down, I think that's, I mean, as you experienced with Gord Struthers, probably like yeah. things are complex, but if you can explain them simply, it shows that you really understand them, right? Yeah. But like a lot of these things are so complex and that's why they're actually embedded in stories because stories actually because yeah. you actually understand the the archetype and the symbolism intuitively often yeah. enough if it's done properly right that's why they tell them in stories and you know well carl jung says like like because psycho psychology is such a young science and the reason why it's so young because before then we had myth and religion that's what we had because that's the same mm -hmm. sort of thing that's the way they explain things but they weren't able to explain it properly so that's why they use stories and drawings and symbols. Yeah. That's why they use that stuff. So so I find it interesting anyway. So it passes the time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you got to send, I mean, if you're ever looking for readers for your draft, um, my mom was, she's young, has been so such a part of her work. Really? Uh, hey. In, in recent year, in recent years. Yeah. She's, she just had, she's still doing poetry, but she's also doing uh, visual arts and she just had a show. Uh, in Nelson and she has a new book coming out com this year as well like a new book of poetry and she's just really been going into that as well um, and of course I'm always here to read your stuff too Rob if you ever need readers and I would love to send you my <laughs> scripts too <laughs> maybe <laughs> I will feedback. well I don't mind that like I find that interesting and it's what I'm good at is reading and yeah, and right? uh, analyzing text like I am I don't really have a lot of education in it but i have had some training in it and i and in my spare time what am i doing i'm doing that that's what i'm doing just for the hell of it so i think that's really an indicator of what your interests are is what are you doing in your spare time yeah um exactly. yeah. So that and video games well, so <laughs> <laughs> well this is even more reason i don't know did you like the tv show of uh game of thrones though did you enjoy it well the first four seasons they followed the book really well and or right. three seasons and they so it was so the story was coherent and then what happened was the book the story started passing the book because the book isn't done yet or the books aren't done yet there's like at least two more books in the main series that aren't done and so there's sort of touch points that george martin gave the showrunners like these are things that are going to happen and so they tried to insert them into the story but there was no coherence in that because i don't think they understood what he was trying to do and george martin like he's a writer, but he, I don't think he understands it either. He, he's just trying to build it up. Like I think he understands it intuitively, but it's very difficult for him to, to describe to people what these kind of things mean. And I think it takes years of actual research and insight to understand what he's trying to do there. Cause he hits some of these touch points. Like, I don't know, this King's gonna burn his daughter in the story, right? And I'm kind of understanding why he's going to do that. Like I'm not justifying, it, but like, I'm, I understand why he's doing it. And there's, there's sort of a symbolic and there's a mythological purpose for this sort of thing, but they kind of put it in there because he's trapped in snow he's, and it was sort of magical, right. That would melt the snow, but, it, but it's like, there's no, why would you burn your daughter for that? Like, but there's actually a reason why he's going to do it. 
and it's, it's, it has to do with sacrifice and giving up everything that you have for the right reasons sort of a thing so they put that in the story it was just it was meaningless and then the other stuff the way they treated daenerys who's the heroine who she ends up being a villain it didn't show her progress like like women can become villains but like it just sort of meant like she was kind of just mad and a switch turned on and she became a bad person it's like that's not the way that's not the way this guy's been writing and her path is she actually turns from a virgin to a mother to a queen and then in, she's turning herself into a dragon there's a bit of an arc there mm. and the way she's the way she i i think it she's turning into a dragon out of justice like that's what the queens do they have to be just and justice doesn't mean kind justice doesn't mean compassionate so, well maybe maybe it's compassionate but it doesn't mean you're, you're kind or doing something that everybody likes like right not doing trying to be cruel for the sake of being cruel and that's the way it kind of was appearing in the story so i don't think they understood her character at all mm. so did i enjoy the story it did well they do a lot of that sex exploitation right or no sex position they call yeah. that right where they hbo <laughs> that's fun and stuff like we have to talk over people having sex behind you it's like okay fine <laughs> I don't hate that, but it's, it's, it's like, it's to me, I don't really care if that was there or not. I would, I would still watch it. Do you ever watch a show or I don't know if you read the books. I don't know. Did no, you watch, did you watch a show? No. I haven't watched the show and I haven't read the books, but I know there's one of the actors in it. Apparently he's always around Copenhagen and people see him like Jeff saw him at a coffee shop once. So yeah, Jamie Lannister. Who's that? Jamie Lannister is the character's name. He's from okay. Denmark. Yeah. He's from Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess he's around a lot because a guy I work with um, at the ad agency where I work um, two days a week, he snapped a picture of him in a coffee shop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just like put it on his Facebook. I forget how it's pronounced. It's Nikolai Koster Valder or something like that. Nikolai. Yeah, right? that's right. Nic yeah. He's something a beautiful like man. That. He's a beautiful man. He had like a full beard and long hair of the picture I saw. Yeah. Oh yeah, might be for a role he had or something like that too. Yeah, Who knows? maybe. So, but he's 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 uh, he's actually a charming rogue. That guy. He starts off as a villain, but he has an arc. Okay. He's develops yeah. a consciousness. He's, he's actually really good. So, but okay, that's Game of Thrones. I don't want to talk about Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk about Between Waves, and I mm -hmm. I want to get it because I saw it. It was available at the Portland um, yeah. Film Festival site, but then it's not there anymore. It's not available anymore. So I was like, ah, oh, I was gonna watch that. But it's coming up, I think, at Whistler, uh, the yes, film festival well, coming up. Exactly. Next weekend, yeah. it's going to be available. I guess this is how they do these the film festival things now because they're online, so they have to like, yeah, they have yeah. their limited time to show it online on screen or for people to stream it, I guess. And um, yeah, so it's premiering. The Canadian premiere is this coming weekend. Right. So it's sort of a sci-fi type film, right? Like that's which I find really interesting. And because yeah. uh, because I don't like like sci-fi, I don't really care about a Star Trek. I don't care about the gadgets and all that kind of stuff. They're kind of fun or whatever else. I like it when sci-fi tells a psychological story, mm -hmm. right? It's it's it, it's a way to understand ourselves by separating us from the real world. Like give us sort of a thing, but it grounds us in the real world. That's what that looks like, right? There's not a lot of like no gadgets or devices in there, right? Exactly. No, there is, and the gadget that was designed was actually yeah. There was, we, we, kind of created, we spent a long time, Virginia and I, coming up with the pseudoscience for this, yeah. like, the, yeah, the different dimensions and the travel into different dimensions and how it works and all that stuff. And, yeah. Um, yeah, in early drafts, it was really clunky and we eventually got it to a place where people were talking about things other than the pseudoscience. We're like, yes, yes, that's what you want. It's a plot device to try to get you thinking that, in that, that way. That's the whole point is to kind of thinking in, in in your case parallel dimensions right yeah exactly yeah. so it was virginia's idea um originally was so she, her her husband's family lives in the azores so she would go there on these trips oh, and she okay. just struck yeah so she, which is why they chose to to shoot there because it was very accessible and they had uh, some places to stay um and they knew the island like she knew the island very well so um she she had this idea she has a really um she has an, an interesting relationship with grief because her father took his own life. Um, oh, when she wow. was in her 20s. Yeah. So 
and it was just at an age where she was starting to separate, like leave home. Like she was kind of a bit of a caretaker for him because he was bipolar and he had issues. Mm. And she's talked about this publicly. So I feel like I can, I can tell you and tell the listeners because she's talked about it now in interviews yeah. and stuff. Right. Um, but so that was part of why I think that drove her to this story. And it's the idea of like her dad in his, towards the end of his life, he was like having experiences that were like not, not real, but they felt really real to him. Mm -hmm. And she at times was like, is he having glimpses of stuff that we maybe don't see? Like, you know, she was like, is he, is he just crazy right. or is there something else? Like, and you know, <clears throat> she did her best to take care of him. And then just as she was saying, I know I really have to focus on school. I'm going to move out. And that's when he, when he, um, he stepped in front of a train and she felt such guilt, I think. And she talks about yeah. it. And that it was yeah. for her working through that, I think a little bit with this film and then, the idea of the main character, like she has this promise from her uh, lover that before he before he dies, that he's going to meet her right. in in this other place. And so she wonders when she finds out. Yeah, he's actually when she saw him in the on the riverbank, the cop said that his body had already been dead for a day. Like, how could this be? Like, is, mm -hmm. is, was he coming to her from another dimension? Maybe there's a possibility. So she goes to the island, and they had planned this trip, and she's there trying to figure out and try to see him. And then she does start seeing him. And as the audience were kind of wondering, like, is she, is this him? Could this be real? Or is yeah. she, um, you know, having some mental health issues? So right. Virginia yeah. really wanted to dance around that and kind of keep yeah. that mystery going. And that's the point, right? Is, is mm -hmm. her, it's our perceptions. Because the mm -hmm. perceptions don't always tell us that, like the, the, the physical truth. It's, yeah. We don't perceive the yeah. world that way. We perceive an interpretation of the world. Yeah, right? it's true. Yeah, exactly. So I have a, I have a complaint about the trailer as I've seen it, because I think that the uh, protagonist's lover, Isaac, is far yeah. too ha he's far too handsome. I went to yeah, school, undergrads, with all these physicists, and none of them were like that. <laughs> no, I know. No, I know. He's <laughs> Much closer to the Big Bang Theory than... <laughs> <laughs> I know. He's exceptionally... Uh, it's so the story about it's very him, manly, he, yes. I know he's a made-for-TV scientist, right? Yeah. Um, but he's a really good guy, and um, oh yeah, just always. I mean, I was around for the Toronto section of uh, part, portion of the shoot, yeah. um, but we actually moved to Copenhagen like two weeks after the Toronto shoot happened, so I right. couldn't. Oh, I okay. couldn't even go to the Azores. I was going to originally go to the Azores. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you. And yeah. I couldn't go. No, because we were already over here, and it's more expensive to fly from Copenhagen to the Azores than from Toronto to the Azores, ironically. But uh, Luke, the yeah. actor who played the the lover guy, he was like, he because he only had a few scenes when he was in the Azores, right. but he had to go. But he only shot for one day out of the two weeks or whatever they were there. And okay. every day, like, he was just helping. He's like, what can I do? And Virginia's like, go, see the island, have fun. You don't, you're not shooting. He's like, no, no, I want to do I want, I'll carry sandbags. Yeah. I'll do whatever. Like, he was so committed. Like, he was a great, like, a great person cool. as well as a great performer. Yeah. Oh, you like really to hear that. Fun. Yeah, that's really nice. Well, again, but, like, if you're in the Azores, right, that's in the middle of the ocean. Actually, it's this little, it's a weird little outcrop that's surrounded by nothing but water. But again, like from psychological perspective, what I'm learning here too, like look, look, look this person's going in the middle of this, just because the ocean means chaos, it, psychologically mm -hmm. speaking, right? And it's it's the unknown, and between waves, while there's, again, I'm a physics person, I'm always thinking of like yes. waves, <laughs> waveforms all the time. You know that, I, but uh, but again, also under waves, though, too, that it's it, you're actually going into your subconscious, your unconsciousness, and exploring that sort of thing too. That's what I kind of saw from that. And I'm not sure if it's yeah. conscious on decision on you, your guys' part for that, but that's what I see. And maybe that's what the audience sees as well, too, because she has to go inside herself, which is what she's trying to do, I'm thinking, to understand yeah. the mystery of her relationship with, with Isaac. And maybe yes. it resolves itself on screen, maybe it doesn't, but it's the journey that she has to take. And she can't, she doesn't do that on top of a mountain. She does that in the ocean. Yeah. It's two separate things good. like that insightful the, the thing about the waves like also the the delta and the theta waves like right brain waves and like the depth like the idea of right. like deep meditation and kind of maybe that you know people say transcendence would happen when you theta waves or whatever right isn't it is that right i think you're right the th it's the theta i keep hearing about all the time too yeah, yeah. and really oh. like from a physicist's point of view everything's made of waves 
matter is yeah. actually waves, right? If you get down to this sub sub subatomic level, we're all just waveforms. What's waves? Waves are just energy. It's all it is. Right. And matter is a way is a particular way that waves are constructed. Yeah, That's, and matter is such a such a minimal part of our universe, right? Compared yeah. to energy. Yeah. It's energy. Everything's energy. Matter is just a it's form of energy. energy. It's just it's just yeah. a type of energy. So nuclear guy and all that stuff so yeah yeah well, i hope you enjoy i hope you enjoy the movie because oh, yeah. we did talk about a lot of this stuff too like um, we read a book that was very <laughs> it was pretty deep and um or pretty dense in terms of the science of of like parallel universes and it was interesting okay. but it, it was almost like it just it made you think anything's possible right because that's yeah true. when you start to read those books you're like oh wow yeah, from mathematical point, these universes do exist. They are a reality. It's just right. that are, how are we able to perceive them? And mm -hmm. and that's a great thing about like really good science fiction that I like. Again, it's the way that we it it, 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 it approaches the way we perceive things. So like the movie Arrival is a good example. Like oh, yeah. it's about aliens arriving, but no, it's not. It's about communication and about how communication can alter the way we view things and perceive things that's what it's about communication and time yeah and the aliens are just they're just in a, a mechanism to make us think that way and then i saw a movie by lars von trier the other day um i know he's not everybody's uh yeah, favorite but, but he's a he's a huge influence on virginia so oh good yeah because because like i saw melancholia i've that's never seen we, that we watched, yeah, we watched that movie actually kind of as research for this. Oh, good. Perfect. Yeah, I just watched the other night and I was thinking, oh, I got to mention this to you because it's a, it's a sci-fi film. It's about the end of the world, but no, it's not. It's about depression. Yeah. That's what it's about. And it's about actually how do you see, understand what depression actually is and not to hate it, but to actually to, to embrace it and to accept it. And that's what that character was doing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what the hell is her, mm -hmm. hell's her name? Uh, Kristen Dunst. That's Kristen what her Dunst. character was doing. She was actually embracing this, and her sister didn't understand that. And it took to the end for her sister to like to, because her sister, Kristen Dunst, is one with the huge debilitating depression. Mm -hmm. but when it's actually hitting her sister, she's there for her. And it's like, we're in this yeah. together. She gets it. It's like, holy Christ, what a deep, profound movie that is. It's like a, an uplifting movie about depression. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, right? Like, and, uh, but it, it, but it's science fiction. It's not a, it could never happen in, in the way we have in a world, but it's, it's a way we can kind of perceive the world. So that's, that's good science fiction in my mind. So when I saw those films, it kind of reminded me of, saw your trailer. That's what it reminded me of. Oh, that's, that's so, I'm going to tell Virginia, she'll be so touched. And also, Lars yeah. Hunter Danish. So, <laughs> Sorry? I don't know. If, He's, he's Danish. Lars von Trier is Danish. And yes. He's in so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's been out there for a lot of people. I don't, I don't, I don't recommend yeah. it to everybody, but I know a lot of filmmakers, like I follow film Twitter and film groups quite a bit and they're all huge fans of his. Mm -hmm. He'll never win an Oscar, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But did he win one or something? Or maybe he did. Or nominated. nominated. nominated maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Be, like before, not uh, what's Anyway, yeah. Yeah, like movies like Nymphomaniac. Yeah, it's not for everybody, so. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> for good reasons. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's good. Yeah, and well, that's amazing that you, that that, that was an influence because, and that I recognize that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you got one fan that's anyways, cool. so. Yay. <laughs> Cool. Well, good. I'm so glad to talk to this about you. I wanted to talk to this about. I was so excited when I saw you talk about this. It's a feature film. It's full length yeah. feature film, and and you had a significant role in, in building a story out of that. I think that's amazing. Yeah, it was really great. I mean, again, working with Virginia as a like I co-wrote it with her, and she hired me to write it with her, and we're working on her next movie already now. So oh, excellent, um, yeah. Which is great. It's, it's really, gonna be yeah, set in a really beautiful spot that you get to travel to. <laughs> Um, well, it's going to be a dystopian <laughs> story, actually, <laughs> kind oh, of the opposite. Whatever. Probably a complete soundstage situation. Okay. But we'll see. Who knows? Yet. Okay. Well, yeah. that's that's really cool. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that when it comes out, or if you ever want to talk about it, let me know. We don't have yeah. to rec like just tell people. You don't have to record these every time. Recording is a mechanism that we can use to it forces me to try to create a story or do a path. But we can talk anytime too. We have this technology available to us so we can do it anytime yeah, we want, totally. So. totally totally 
Yeah. It's good stuff. Well, yeah. we've been talking for over an hour, so that's my limit. Okay. And All right. I'll probably let it's you go cool. here. And Jeff's okay though. He's doing fine. Yeah. He was going to pop in and say hi, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> And for the Jeff. viewers out there, Jeff, I knew him from the Students Union. He was actually a VP of the yeah. University of Saskatchewan yeah. Students Union a couple years before me, two years or three years. And and I was actually on student council when he was on. So that's how I got to know Jeff. And that's how you would have met him as well, too. Yeah. Little... Oh, no. You no, know, I knew him longer than that. Did you really? Do you know the story? So we, uh, when I was like... Um, I know he always he... liked you. <laughs> oh, I don't know if he did. <laughs> I always liked him. I didn't know if he always liked me. Um, but he uh, worked at a movie theater called the Broadway Theater in Saskatoon. Oh, yeah. 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 And I lived down the street from the Broadway Theater. So I would take my little brothers to matinees on the weekend. Okay. And he worked there. So that was the first time uh... I saw him. It was then. And I knew who he was then. And I was like, he was four years older than me. So I was just oh, yeah. you know, admiring him. But <clears throat> I was 13. So. <laughs> <laughs> Might have liked him. You don't know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So that's the first but then also in high school our paths crossed we went to different high schools in Saskatoon but we went to model United Nations and met there and sent notes there oh, okay also. well there you go all well, those little yeah little so, indicators I don't know <laughs> so we grew up and we also grew up in the same neighborhood in Saskatoon so not that we hung out or anything but it's interesting now because his parents still live there so and my parents don't so I get to go back to Saskatoon and be in and hang out there which is so nice yeah that is pretty nice yeah it's kind of weird how these kind of relationships happen like amber's dad is from like grew up about 40 miles from where i grew up no way weird oh little God. coincidence that that was too and then i don't know it's, just, it's always a little coincidence that kind of happened with family sometimes and... totally i wanted to ask about amber but i don't know if that's kosher on the podcast if she likes to be talked about a little bit yeah she's fine she's doing yeah. okay she's working at the library right now in saskatoon like, you know, when we had kids too, like she wanted to uh, be around the kids, especially when they're little. And so she went to communications as well. And then she would do sort of part-time communications uh, support and roles and uh, was a, as a consultant and then also just working for little organizations here and there. But her point was she wanted to be around the kids mm. in a role like that as well too. So, and she's just, she's uh, working at the library now because well, it's easy stress-free yeah. <laughs> and she reads a ton of books like she knows part of her job is like works with the collections so she knows what oh. books are coming in she knows what's which books are getting read a lot and which ones aren't and so part of her job is get rid of the ones or switch out the ones that want try to bring in the people that the ones that people want or whatever it is but she also knows the new ones coming in so she puts her name on top of the pile of all the new books that come in she's read like a book a week like this year like Wow. On average. Good for her. Or she's read oh, over 50 books. Yeah. I've often thought a job like that would be like the dream job, right? Like just, yeah. Good well, for her. it's definitely, there's some advantages. And I think, yes, you would actually appreciate it. Um, that sort of thing. But I think she's going to try to get back into communications a bit more coming in the new year. Look, maybe look for a job. She's been up upgrading her, um, her Adobe suite uh, knowledge because that's what you kind of need now for a communications person. You have to have that sort of you know, you have to have experience in Illustrator and InDesign and Photoshop, at least some sort of ability. You maybe don't have to do it all, but you have to be able to do touch-ups and mm -hmm, speak the language mm -hmm. and stuff. So that's kind of stuff that she's upgrading herself. She's, she's already a good writer. She understands how to build a communications plan and, and uh, you know, implement those. But you always have to get those skills going, you know, you don't. Yeah. Totally. Around. But she's doing okay. Hey. All right. It's cold winter here. <laughs> is it is it a cold one it's snowy as hell here like we've had a pretty nasty snow early snowfall which we don't normally get here normally if we get snow it comes in january february so it closed down the city for a number of days and uh really wow yeah and the city never budgets enough for snow removal and it just it bugs the hell out of me it's like well it's, it's out of the ordinary I'm like well yeah but it can happen like it's one in 10 chance that it could happen maybe you should prepare for it more and it, it happened right yeah. around this, the, the municipal election was going on so everybody's all angry <laughs> oh, i heard about this like they had shut down the polls or something or they yeah had they had, well they yeah like i actually went to vote the morning of like the, the next morning i went to vote and i walked two blocks to the polling station and it took me about 20 minutes to walk there 
and God. so they postponed it to, from Monday to the Friday, or at least they allowed my vote to stand, you know, those kind of people, but they moved it out to the following Friday. But even though, so we only got like 25% of people who were able to vote. Like the roads were terrible. Like you couldn't get, yeah. most oh. roads were closed right down. That's Saskatoon though. Like it, it doesn't melt at all. Like it wouldn't say Vancouver, you get a big dump, but it would melt or even Calgary. You get yeah, a big dump, yeah. but, it, but it actually warms up usually afterwards. Like, we had it. a whole, we had a whole winter here last year in Copenhagen with no snow. It's crazy. Like we're at the same latitude as Larange, So we have like a yeah. lot of dark, but we don't have precipitation. We have rain, but today it was plus eight. Like it's, it doesn't get like, it's between zero and plus 10. It's like very Vancouver -y actually. Very yeah, Vancouver I could I could imagine that. Yeah, yeah. Right off the ocean yeah. gets sort of the breezes. Oh, well, the current actually I think drives it. it the uh, the North Sea current goes through there, and it yeah, keeps the temperatures more. Yeah. yeah, so it keeps it more moderate. Well, like London, right? It's north of London, but it's like yeah, That's like true. that sort of thing too. Well, the Vikings, man, they're they love that kind of stuff too. I love the Vikings oh, yeah. as well. I want to go there and see the Vikings. You Certainly. totally should. There's like amazing um, museums here. And I was just like, I went for a walk down to the sea. Like we're very close to the water. Um, just we're at a, really close to a beach. And I was just sitting there on the dock looking at the water just a little while ago. And there was like, Max is laughing because he took a video of me talking about the dog that I met <laughs> on the beach on the dock. <laughs> it's very funny. Man. Yeah. No, don't play it. Please don't play it. It's so no, you don't have to, man. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. But um, there was like, oh, I was looking and I'm like, was oh, there something in the distance? And there was all of these, there's people out sailing today and there was all of these uh, wind, wind yeah. surfers. Out. And like, the, it's, pl it's like plus six, but it, you know, it's not, the sea is very cold and People love just people are like the same way people in Saskatchewan are like all weathers. Let's go. Let's bundle up and go outside. That's the same as here. Like it doesn't matter if it's pouring rain in the middle of winter. People are out on their bikes with their rain gear and yeah, I like that about this place. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Get on the sleds and uh, or go ice fishing or whatever the people do here. Yeah. Right. Same thing. It's a sort of yeah. attachment to the land that's around yeah. you. Or in your case, the ocean that's around you. Right. It's part of who you are. And uh, yeah. <sighs> That's crazy, man. It's absolutely crazy. crazy. So maybe that that's what my cue is. Maybe I should go for a walk right now. It's yeah. It's probably yeah. a nice, nice day. Bundle up. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Get the cocoa ready and uh I got the Baileys going. So nice. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Well, I think we'll let you go here, Katie. I think we, we, okay. we hit we hit everything okay. we need to hit. <laughs> Super. Thanks for for taking the time to chat and recording it. It's very nice just to catch up with you. But yeah, thanks for having me as a guest on your podcast. Yeah, it feels so good to talk to my friends and see you guys again. And uh, it helps me right there to, yeah. to, in the stupid times that we live in. So I appreciate you coming on here. We'll be in touch and we can connect again. We want to try to connect more often. Like, it doesn't have to be every week, but like, you know, a couple times a year or something like that. Let's try to. For sure try to connect more often anyways and, and hopefully jeff can pop and say hi next time because i think he's on another call right <laughs> i hear him talking down the hall <laughs> it's okay tell jeff i said hi he knows i say hi and uh yeah and he says hi back okay okay cool okay. i'm gonna stop it right now